the rendition of Lacan that understands the pre discourse of as an impossibility promises a critique that conceptualizes the law as prohibitive and generative at once. That the language of physiology or disposition does not appear here is welcome notes. But binary restrictions nevertheless still operate to frame and form its sexuality and delimit and advance the forms of its resistance to the real. And marking off the very domain of what is subject to repression, exclusion operates prior to repression, that is, in the delimitation of law and its objects of subordination. Although one can't argue that for like repression creates the repressed through the prohibitive and pattern of law, that argument does not account for the pervasive nostalgia for the lost fullness of joy since his work. Indeed, the loss could not be understood as loss unless the very irrecoverability of the pleasure did not designate a past that is buried from the present through the prohibitive law. But we can only that past from the position of the fondest subject is not to say that that past does not reemerge within that subject's speech as filler, this kind of noise, metonymic slippage. The trail of new minnow really existed for Kant. The pre-juridical past of Joe since is unknowable from within spoken language. That does not mean, however, that this past has no reality. The very inaccessibility of the past, indicated by metonymic slippage and contemporary speech, confirms that original fullness is the ultimate reality. The further question emerged, what plausibility can be given for an account of a symbol that requires a conformity to the law that proves impossible to perform? And that makes no room for the flexibility of the law itself, its cultural formation in more plastic forms. The injunction to become sexed in the ways prescribed by the symbolic always leads to failure and, and in some cases to the exposure of the phantasmatic nature of sexual identity itself. The symbol is claimed to be cultural intelligibility in its prison and hegemonic form effectively consolidates the power of those fantasies as well as the various dramas of identificatory failures. The alternative is not to suggest that identification should become a valuable accomplishment, but there does seem to be a romanticization or indeed a religious idealization of failure, humility and limitation before the law, which makes the Lacanian narrative ideologically suspect. The dialectic between a juridical imperative that cannot be fulfilled and an inevitable failure before the law recalls the torture relationship between the God of the Old Testament and those humbly servants who will offer their obedience without reward. That sexually no one but this religious impulse in the form of the day man to love considered to be an absolute demand. That is distant from but needed is our a kind of ecstatic transcendence that eclipses sexually altogether. Lends for credibility to the symbolic as that which operates for him and subjects is the inaccessible or all determined dirty. The structure of religious tragedy in the Canyon theory effectively undermines any strategy of cultural politics to configure an alternative imaginary for the play of desires. The symbol it guarantees the failure of the tacit commands, perhaps its purposes, like those of the Old Testament God, are altogether ontological. Not the accomplishment of some goal, but obedience and suffering when forced to subject's sense of limitation before the law. There is, of course, the comic side to this drama that is revealed through the disclosure of the permanent impossibility of the realization of identity. But even this comedy is the inverse expression of an enslavement to the God that it claims to be unable to overcome. Lacanian theory must be understood as a kind of slave morality. How would Lacanian theory be formulated after the appropriation of Nietzsche's insight on the genealogy of morals that God, the inaccessible symbolic, is rendered inaccessible by a power, the world too poor, that regularly institutes its own powerlessness? The figuration of pattern of law as the inevitable and unknowable authority before which the sex subject is bound to fail must be read for the theological impulse that motivates it as well as for the critique of theology that points beyond it. The construction of the law that guarantees failure is symptomatic of slave morality that this of us the very generative powers that uses to construct the law as a permanent possibility. What is the power that creates this fiction that reflects inevitable subjection? What are the cultural stakes in keeping power within that self-negating circle and might that power be reclaimed from the trappings of a prohibitive law that is that power and its dissimulation and self-subjection?